There he is. There he is. <laughs> Mm. Well, I was I was late to the previous session I was chairing too, and now my whole day is back up. <laughs> but for bloating my calendar. <laughs> a few more attendees as well. Stuart's taking notes. See what? Stuart's taking notes. Oh, very nice. Uh, yeah, I think yes. so. I think you should be working. Thanks. So with the chair slides, it, the, the agenda section now looks like that. So we've got perfect. Those three are first session. Those three are second yeah. session. Yeah. Awesome. You want to go around? Okay. So you'll have to jump in if I forget anything. Yeah. Okay, let's start. So, um, welcome to the DNSSD meeting for 117. We've actually got two hour long sessions uh, this meeting. So, we've got this hour at a break and then the second hour. Um, we have the usual note well. So, um, just a reminder that these are our policies. Um, by participating in this meeting, you agree to abide by them. Um, so if you have any IPR, then hello, Stuart. Just a really quick trivial question. Are we planning to have a break and grab coffee, or are we planning just to work through just so people know what to expect? We're planning to have the break. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> They turn the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> so that for particularly um, for those joining remotely, the second session will be a different Metoco link. Um, so in the note, well, yes, if you are aware of any IPR, they ha that has to be disclosed, and you agree to um, abide by our rules regarding engagement and being nice to people. Um, so we take this seriously. Um, it hasn't generally been a problem. Um, next. So Stuart has kindly volunteered to uh, take minutes, which will be just recording substantive um, decisions or, or actions. Um, if you, you should on your client have access to the chat, uh, um, which you can also, which is provided by Zulip, but available also in Meteco. And as I said, we've got two different Miteco links. So the first one of those is for this session. Uh, we have some handy links for, um, for information for this working group, uh, the charter, the documents, the, the materials collected for all of this meeting, which is basically the slides and the agenda. And of course, we have the mailing list, which is where we decide everything. We also have a GitHub organization. So that's where we maintain our working group documents. You can find them all there. You can raise issues and pull requests. Um, if you have another document, you can contact the chairs to get that set up. So for this first hour, this is what we have on the agenda. So we're going to give you an update on both SRP and update lease. Um, Ted is going to tell us about uh, the latest on advertising proxy. And we'll then go into some discussion of issues that have been found with SRP replication 
Um, so hopefully that should be quite an interactive session. So please jump in um, if you've got any ideas. Yeah, this is one of the benefits of meeting that we can we get to debate all this. So for the second hour, which is after the break, we're going to go and cover um, TSR and um, experiences that have been found in terms of um, conflicts that can arise and how to manage that. So we need to come up with a good solution there. Um, we'll also have some discussion on future work options. Um, so um, we'd like your input on that. Um, and then the last one is um, Nate's multicast stream discovery. So Stuart posted on the list about that today. Um, with some thoughts. So uh, that would be good to share and see what you all think of this and whether you're interested. Any requests for changes in terms of the agenda for the first or the second hour? In that case. So we have two documents that we are progressing. Um, so they are both on the ISG telechat for the 10th of August. Yeah, 10th of August. Um, uh, the colored dots there tell you that the current status of the reviews there. So we've got one discuss, um, but most of it has uh, yet to indicate a status, but that's normal. Uh, anything else you want to stay on the status of those? No. <laughs> so we we value the input of the ISG, of course. Can you ask the question at the mic for the remote folks? Uh, yeah. So the question was, uh, am I intending to do an update for the telechat? So when what telechat is this on now? Oh, twenty eight. I should be able to do an update for that, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't see anything in Roman's question that seemed like it was going to be like impossible to deal with. So, uh, we, yeah. Thank you. Um, and advertising proxy. So, uh, we adopted this a while back. Um, there were comments made on the list during adoption. There was a minor update in January this year. Um, the document actually expired two weeks ago, um, but Ted will tell us more in a minute. Uh, so that's it for the chairs. Uh, the blue sheets are virtual, which means you just need to log into Meet Echo, but we have a physical reminder that I'm going to pass around the room. So don't pass it to the next person until you've actually signed them. Virtually. Was he on the agenda? Yes. Okay. So on the topic of the draft expiring, I actually did submit a dash 03, but it somehow got lost by the data tracker and then it expired. I don't know what happened. Huh. Yeah. That's weird. I mean, it's possible that I submitted it and there was some nit that I didn't notice. And so I thought I was done, but I wasn't. But anyway, um, I'll be submitting an actual update soon. Um, okay. So next slide. Uh, I'm Ted Lemon, by the way. Hi. Um, so uh, we've had some discussion about um, what exactly should be in this document. And um, we went back and forth between it should just talk about the advertising proxy function or it should talk about the entire general uh, set of functions that uh, something that's doing the advertising proxy function might do. Um, and so right now the draft is still kind of in that second mode, but um, I think that the general uh, agreement after the last meeting was that we would uh, just have it talk about the advertising proxy function. So I made a little bit of a start on that and I'll post an update um, probably today or tomorrow with that. Um, but I haven't taken all of that language out yet. Um, so uh, I'll talk some more about that later sort of at the end of the next session. Next slide. 
So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is operational experience. Um, this is actually the, the advertising proxy exists in um, a lot of devices that are, you know, consumer devices that, that are being used. Specifically, the, the use case that I know of where this, where this is widely deployed currently is in thread border routers, both from Apple and uh, OpenThread, which includes Google and various other uh, producers of thread border routers. Um, and we've had pretty good experiences with generally. Um, there have been a few issues. Um, the main issues have to do with uh, name, sort of spurious name conflicts where we get a name conflict that really shouldn't have happened. Um, issues with scalability when we have either a lot of border routers in the same home network or uh, a lot of devices. And uh, also just problems with having more than one MDNS uh, registrar, responder, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about some of that here. And some of this, um, the four presentations are actually informed by this presentation. So some of the stuff I won't get into detail about in this presentation, but will be discussed in other presentations. Next slide. So, um, so the first issue is uh, that, um, you know, for redundancy, we want to, or for reliability, um, when these devices, which are consumer devices that may be like on light switches, so somebody might just flip a light switch and have one of these go away, we want them to survive that experience. Um, we want the, the, the functionality to survive that experience. And that means that we're going to wind up having more than one of these devices active at a time. Um, the problem with having more than one of these devices active at a time is that uh, that means that they're all uh, trying to register essentially the same names and we see name conflicts. We're not supposed to see name conflicts. Um, and we added something called TSR, which I've presented on in the past uh, to try and address some of these conflicts. Um, but uh, that hasn't fully been resolved. Um, so uh, the reasons for these are often a little obscure. We have uh, situations where uh, like the, the process of marshalling a probe message uh, results in some but not all records being included in a particular probe and then the receiving um, MDNS responder which has the full set of records sees that subset of records and says oh well this is obviously a conflict because these aren't the same and so we we see a name conflict that's that's just totally a self-inflicted wound um, and then uh, you know we can also see situations where uh, one publisher sees a conflict on the host name and one sees a conflict on the service instance name and they both wind up not publishing, <laughs> which is really bad. Um, and also like when for some reason the network renumbers as thread networks sometimes do, um, we see name conflicts just because there was a sudden change in, in, in essentially all of the records registered on the network and chaos occurs and some conflicts occur. So next slide. Um, so I talked a little bit about this. Basically, uh, we have a packet fitting algorithm. We try to put as much stuff into a packet as possible. And so if a bunch of updates happen at once, and a bunch isn't really that many, uh, depends on how many records are, there are in an update, um, then we can get into that situation I was describing where we get a conflict because the, the information is incomplete in the probe, but complete in the auth database of the recipient, recipient of the probe. Um, so next slide. Um, and then the service instance thing, um, I'm not sure exactly how this happens. I think what happens is that we get into a situation where the TSR record um, has a time difference of zero. Um, and so that means that we have a conflict and then we try to do conflict resolution based on the comparison algorithm that's specified in 67, 62, which basically says sort the records and, and the one that's earliest in the sort wins. Um, and because we have multiple records in an SRP update, uh, we wind up seeing um, like the host name might, might win on one server and the, the uh, service instance name might, might win on the other. And then because of the way we've implemented the advertising proxy, the advertising proxy wants to get everything registered or nothing. And so each one of them gets half <laughs> and then they both withdraw because they got a name conflict and then we have no registration. So, um, an additional problem here, um, and this goes to the self-inflicted wound thing again, is you know because these are these are conflicts that 
really needn't happen. They aren't actual conflicts. Um, so, and I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail in the TSR document, but um, I'm just talking about this here because it's relevant to the advertising proxy work. Um, so Matter, uh, which is a big consumer of thread right now, and also of, of uh, DNSSD in general, um, enforces name uniqueness. Every name is made unique when the device is onboarded to the network. And uh, so uh, MDNS normally deals with name conflicts by renaming. If we get a spurious name conflict where there really isn't a conflict, renaming doesn't work. So we need some other strategy to deal with that. Um, and so our current strategy of either asking the client to renumber, which it won't, or uh, that's to, to say choose a different name or choosing a different name ourselves, neither one of those works. So next slide. By the way, um, I have a tendency to go through these slides really fast. If there's something that I'm saying here that doesn't make sense to you, the whole point of us having two hours is that if somebody has a question, they can ask the question. So please don't feel like you have to wait until the end of this presentation to ask questions or criticize or comment or whatever. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. So in a stub network, uh, like a thread network or you know what we're discussing in Snack, um, uh, it's the, the, num the numbering on the network is associated with a particular stub router. Uh, so Snack, uh, describes this, and, and we do pretty much the same thing in Thread. Um, whichever stub, stub router shows up first picks a ULA address randomly, a slash 48, and advertises that on the network. Um, and you know we have a strategy for dealing with like two routers arriving at the same time, what do we do, and stuff like that. The result of that is that sometimes the network winds up renumbering. Um, it can renumber because a stub router went away, or it can renumber because um, uh, because of the sort of conflict resolu resolution process at the beginning. We, uh, and so as a consequence, when that happens, we might have registrations from all of the hosts on the network. Suddenly all of the hosts on the network have different IP addresses. That means we have to do a whole bunch of MDNS updates all at once. And uh, that the chaos that ensues there um, tends to produce name conflicts. Um, and, you know, some of the things that I described before, like the, 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 uh, resource record marshalling issue, I think are responsible for a lot of that. So, next slide. So um, we can have a lot of different kinds of conflicts. Um, you can have conflicts between stale data and fresh data, which TSR is supposed to deal with. We can have conflicts because there are actually two independent services claiming the same name. That's an actual legitimate conflict as opposed to a self-inflicted wound. We can have the partial conflict I described before, or the host name and the service instance name. One of them is in conflict and the other isn't. Um, the other thing we can have is conflicts between namespaces. Um, and I didn't actually draw a slide for this, but um, basically the idea here is if you think about um, MDNS, MDNS is a namespace that applies to a particular link. So a particular multicast domain. Um, so if you have more than one multicast domain, you have more than one namespace. Um, Similarly, SRP, while it's not a multicast domain, is essentially updating a namespace. It's updating a database that contains all the names in the namespace. Um, and so uh, when we're thinking about conflicts, um, the way that we think about conflicts needs to take into account the fact that we have all of these namespaces. And what do we do uh, when we have conflicts? Essentially, uh, when we try to represent multiple namespaces in a single namespace, MDNS on a particular link, um, uh, a disambiguation problem becomes a name conflict problem. And so, um, so part of when we think about conflicts, we need to think about this in terms both of actual conflicts where there are two things that really do have the same name and we need to do something about that versus situations where we simply have ambiguous names and we might want to do something different to resolve that issue. So, um, and, and you know, so and as you can see, really only item number two here, the conflict, conflict between two independent services is actually a conflict. Everything else is something that we wind up treating as a conflict that is not. So next slide. So um, I've been thinking about this for a while. And um, when I say this is a proposed solution, I do not mean to present this as a fait accompli. Um, 
I'm proposing this very much in the sense of a proposal. I think this might work. I'd love to hear people criticize this proposal or suggest ways to improve it. Um, and the proposal is basically uh, to go with that namespace idea. Um, an SRP zone is a different namespace than an MDNS zone. If you have multiple SRP zones, each SRP zone is its own namespace. If you have multiple links, each MDNS zone is its own namespace. If there are uh, conflicts between leftmost labels in those namespaces, uh, we deal with that in a different way than we would deal with actual conflicts. We don't do the MDNS conflict process. So in other words, if you send an SRP update to a zone, then if there isn't an, a conflicting name in that zone, then we don't report a conflict to the client because um, it just doesn't work. Um, so, uh, so we're never gonna ask an SRP client to rename because of an MDNS conflict which is a change from the way we're behaving now. Um, and so I think there are potentially some implications of that we need to think about, but I think it's probably the right thing to do. Um, so uh, the nice thing about this is that it means that SRP replication gets a lot simpler and SRP gets a lot simpler, right? We're just replicating a database we have a pretty good strategy for how to replicate the database as long as we don't have these weird MDNS conflicts. And so we can just like, you know, when an SRP client registers, we update the SRP zone. And then replicating or, or presenting the SRP zone in MDNS is a separate issue. We need to deal with the disambiguation problem there, not in SRP. So, um, so, and then the question is, how do we deal with the conflict on the MDNS side? And this is a little bit problematic. There are a couple of issues here. I mean, one thing that I would love to do <laughs> is uh, just have some additional identifier, like, like, you know, so dot local is the MDNS zone, right? So we could say, okay, anything that's in your SRP zone that has an SRP data set ID of this 64 bit number is, that 64-bit number represented as, let's say, a, 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 what do I say, base64 name dot, sorry, name, the, the leftmost label that was registered with SRP dot that 64-bit thing dot local. The only problem is if you do a query for anything in dot local that is not, and this, I've only checked this on, MD, on, on uh, Apple's platform, so I don't know what happens on Linux, but if you try to do this on Apple's platforms, foo.bar.local produces a DNS lookup, not an MDNS query, right? <laughs> it's a mystery. I don't know why that is, but that is the case. Um, I checked it in the logs. <laughs> so um, so that would, be the, that would be my preference for how to solve this problem, but unfortunately that won't work. Um, so uh, another proposal that I have, I mean, one, one way we could say that is, look, let's just fix that. Maybe, maybe we should just say, you know, uh, if, if you're using a device that's gonna be doing queries of this type, then you need to fix that bug. Um, and that might be a legitimate thing to do. I think we'd have to really think about that. I knew I'd eventually provoke Stuart into getting up and saying something. <laughs> this is where I have to sort of dredge back my ancient memory. Um, I think the reason the code does that dates back 20 years because when we started using dot local for local discovery, um, a, a large company that makes a dominant desktop operating system decided that they would configure all of their customers' Active Directory servers to use dot .local, uh, and that would sabotage Bonjour. And they could have picked literally any other suffix to put on the end without causing trouble, but they, 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 they configured by default and had web pages recommending that every enterprise in the world should use dot local as their internal domain. Not and, that we're bitter. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think that led to 
us having to do a bunch of workarounds because obviously people who work at companies with Max want to be able to check their email. Um, and, and, and I think that's why we decided that while in principle anything dot local is multicast in practice most host names are a single label single label dot local so anything that's three or more labels was probably destined for the active directory server and not for link local yep. uh, that's not philosophically clean uh, and it may not even be necessary anymore because after 15 years who knows how many of those old dot local installations still exist <laughs> um, oh well <laughs> so the sabotage was very effective yeah okay so i mean another thing we could do uh, is just say uh use something under uh service.arpa in the same way right um and that's that's again assuming that we're willing to change all clients that need this functionality problem is i don't know that we really want to do that so the other alternative is we can say okay we're just going to append something and this is actually how mdns renaming works now right you just append some number to the end of the name like if you have two home pods um the first one that comes on the network gets the name home pod the second one that comes on the network gets the name home pod two i think um and so you've got home pod and home pod two and that's just an automatic renaming process that mdns responder does on on max um so uh we could do something similar to that um but we have a slightly different situation because with SRP, we actually have a stable namespace. So it's not the case that we're going to have like, oh, we've got a conflict with the SRP thing and then we get another conflict and we need a new number and then we need a new number. We can pick one number that's always the number for that namespace. Um, probably needs to be like big enough that it's not just like one, but some number that's, that's always going to be used for that namespace. And we just append that to every name that's registered in the SRP zone. So, so SRP, um, you know, particularly if you use the default.service.arpa uh, domain name when you're doing a your registration, SRP is essentially just managing the leftmost label. Um, and so if you've got like a, a PTR record, it's going to be, you know, leftmost label PTR, uh, leftmost label dot service name dot transport name. And then you can forget about what's to the right of that. Um, and so we can just rewrite that. And, and that gives us the ability to very cleanly merge these namespaces without doing weird conflict detection behavior. Um, so that's my proposed solution. I don't know if that's the right solution. I've also talked in the TSR presentation that's coming later about um, how we could improve that. Uh, but that doesn't solve the, the namespace, namespace conflict issue, you know, when we actually have a legitimate conflict or possibly multiple namespaces. Um, so. Uh, Jonathan Hui. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with you separating the namespaces would simplify a lot of things. I, I would really love to go down that path as well, uh, just based on experience uh, yep. trying to implement this stuff. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if any of the solutions proposed uh, allows us to not require modifications on the clients, right? So yeah. what I mean is like matter devices today look for a very specific name, right? Yeah. And so just appending something to the name will yep. probably screw them up. Right. Um, so. I, I, you know, I don't have a solution. I'm just saying I... Yep. Yeah, so um, actually, that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, what I'm proposing here is not that we always append that, but rather that we only append that when we get a conflict. So the thing is, when we get a con... If, so if we get a conflict on a matter name, we're just dead anyway. Like, there's nothing we can do about that. So this doesn't make things worse, and potentially it provides us with a future-proof solution, right? Another thing we could do is... Um, since we're doing this, like basically the, the, the use case that's probably most common right now is going to be Matter, actually. And so we could just say, like, look, we need Matter clients to update so that when they get, uh, you know, a query for, uh, you know, foo.bar.local or whatever, whatever we decide, um, that they do an MDNS query. And so then we just use that. And then the leftmost label winds up just being the the same as it always would have been. And so 
if matter implemented that correctly, which actually it currently doesn't, um, oops, uh, we would have our solution. So I, I think there are a lot of ways to approach this. I, I'd kind of like to come up with a solution soon because you know the sooner we come up with a solution, the the uh, the quicker we can get our installed base running something that that we trust. Because what we have now is a little bit haphazard when we run into a conflict. Now the good news is, if we can deal with the MDNS conflict problem, which I talk about in the TSR draft, then this becomes this this aspect of the problem becomes less of a problem because I think that the problem of conflict between disjoint namespaces is actually relatively small. For example, we should never see a conflict between matter names and in different namespaces. That just shouldn't ever happen. If we see the same name advertised in MDNS and in the SRP zone, it should be the same matter device. So, so in other words, if we don't publish one of them, it should be okay because it should be reachable through the other information. Okay. Yeah, it's Jonathan. I'm just trying to think. So there are matter devices that I know are being developed that support both thread and Wi-Fi yep. simultaneously. So I, in this separate namespace world, we should also think through like what it means for those devices to publish their services. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the one of the things is so so. Uh, this is a little bit talking out of school, but um, the the way that that uh, that we do DNS SD lookups for thread devices, which I believe is in the current spec, so I, I can talk about that. Um, is we look in default.service.arpa. So it just does a DNS query to default.service.arpa. And default.service.arpa then returns answers that may or may not actually be in default.service.arpa. So we do have the option of disambiguating namespaces there, assuming that the matter clients actually do the right thing when they get names that are in, in default.service.arpa. I don't know the answer to that question. I would like to think that what they do is they just take the leftmost label. I don't know if that's true. We should probably figure that out. <laughs> so. Anyway, so so that's kind of that's kind of where that's going, um, and I think you know I don't know how many people in this room are super interested in solving this problem. It's clear that there are a bunch of us that are, and so we will put our heads together. But uh, I'd like to I'd like to do that in the context of DNSSD and not in one of the other standards bodies because I think this is highly relevant to the work that we're doing in DNSSD. And if we have this conversation somewhere else it's going to exclude a bunch of people that should be in the conversation. So um, I may actually propose doing some interim meetings at some point. I know it's a terrifying idea. That, that sounds reasonable. And like in terms of chartering, we can double check, but this feels, it makes sense here. So. Oh, okay. And, right. and remember that it's always like the, one of the big advantages of bringing things at the ITF is that it provides a, a forum with an IPR policy, which is really important for topics like this. Right. Yep. Next slide. I'm not sure if there's a next slide. Ooh, there is a next slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, scalability. So one of the other issues we're running into, and again, I will talk about this some more in the TSR draft, is um, the problem of having uh, registrars handle many names and having there be many registrars. Um, so I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of depth on this right now because I go into it more later, but fundamentally what we're talking about here is like, you know, you've got, first of all, if you've got five registrars, then every time a, regist a, a record gets replicated, it's gonna be probed five times. And that's a lot of MDNS traffic. Also, whenever an SRP registrar um, synchronizes, it's going to probe every single record. So you're going to get this massive storm of MDNS. So we need to talk about how to make that, how to load balance or whatever. I put this slide here. I actually don't know that it's, I, the, the, re, the sense in which it applies to um, the advertising proxy is just that this is a lesson we've learned from deploying advertising proxies. I don't think the solution is actually going to be in the advertising proxy draft. So we should probably not go into more depth about that now. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so I guess we are talking about this now. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I've, I've noticed that um, it, it feels like um, when there are multiple registrars uh, advertising the same records that we get behavior that is surprisingly pessimal. Um, 
like a lot worse than I would expect, including things like probing continues forever, um, which is really bad. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about this more in the in the uh, in the TSR draft. So I don't think we need to go into quite as much detail as on this slide, but um, that's something we need to talk about. Um, and you know, things like you know load balancing to primaries or backups or you know whatever. Um, like should you know should should backups even do probes at all? Um, should we have backups not respond to the first packet that gets sent? Like if there's a query that's sent out, we could notice that the query was sent out, count the fact that the query was sent out, but not reply to it if we're not primary for for the question that it asked or a question that it asked. And then uh, if we see the same question again, then we answer. Anyway, um, next slide. So, um, so I've actually proposed there'll, there'll be some new text in the next version of the document about handling conflicts because the current document basically just says if there's an MDNS conflict, then we have to, like, you know, take down the name and get it, take it out of the SRP zone and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and that I think is just a bad idea. It's very hard to implement. It's very hard to implement in a way that isn't that scales that doesn't like just totally fall over when you have a lot of stuff happening at once. Um, the other problem is I was reading over the document and I thought, well, how would I implement this? Um, it doesn't really give clear guidance for implementers. I mean, you guys implemented it. So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's relatively obvious how to implement it. So the fact that it doesn't give clear guidance is probably not a huge problem, but the problem with vague they're, they're not even vague. The, state, the, the descriptions are fairly clear, but, but there isn't normative language. There isn't a whole lot of normative language. And the problem with that is that I think uh, you wind up getting weird little edge cases that we haven't documented and then you find out about them later. So I think it would be worth going through the exercise of actually translating the current descriptive language into more prescriptive normative language and uh, see what turns up when we do that. Um, and then, you know, obviously, the sooner the better, because, you know, we're already, we already have this stuff deployed. It would be nice to actually have an RFC. Next slide. Ha! We're done. <laughs> okay. How are we doing? So, yeah, we're okay. We can go on to SRP replication. All right. Not possible for questions, but I think yeah. we don't need to pause Is there for too long. Discussion? There does not appear to be discussion. All right, next slide, or next, uh, next slides. Okay, uh, SRP replication, next slide. So uh, we, uh, we published an OO after it was adopted, that expires in October. Um, we've got a lot of things that need to go into the next version of this document, so I don't think it's gonna be a problem to, to update it before October, I hope not. Next slide. Um, so the goal of SRP replication is basically, like I said earlier, we have multiple devices in the network, none of which can be assumed to be powered on at all times. And so we want to make sure that wherever possible, uh, we replicate the database so that if one of those devices gets powered down, the database doesn't get lost. Of course, if they all get powered down, the database still gets lost and we have to recover it using SRP. But we'd prefer to avoid that because, for example, on a thread network or some other IoT network where we have uh, devices running on battery, the fewer times they have to talk to the SRP server, the better. Um, and the other benefit of replication, particularly for uh, IoT mesh networks, um, is that uh, it, allows, uh, it allows the client that's updating to send its update along a shorter path than it otherwise would if, if there were... Um, if it had to just, if there was just one server, then, then you know, some clients would be very close to that and others would be quite far from it. Um, so uh, the way the protocol works, um, for those who haven't read the document, and I'm not, I wanna be really clear that I'm not criticizing here. Um, this, is, uh, this is new work. Um, and so I, I do wanna tell people how it's going, how it's working. Uh, the, the way it works is the, the SRP client is the authority. It's essentially an authority for, its little zones, right? It, it, it's the names that it's claiming, the, the service instance names that it's claiming, 
there might be more than one of those, and the host name that it's claiming, which hopefully there's only one of those. Um, updates are signed. Uh, they use uh, uh, SIG0. Uh, authentication is on a first come first served basis. So once we've gotten an update from a client, we know who it is. Further updates from that client have to also be signed with the same key. Um, and the most recent update is authoritative. We assume the client knows what it's talking about. So if we had an update from it an hour ago and we just got a new update from it, the new update is correct. The old update is stale. Next slide. Um, so operational experience, I talked about the conflict. Um, generally, we, we've been happy with how this works at a small scale, uh, less happy as the scale grows. Um, one of the issues that we see, so SRP, I didn't actually describe this in my brief overview, but SRP, um, it's intended to be completely automated, right? There's no user intervention. It has to come up and work without anybody doing anything. Um, and in order for that to happen, since we're, we, it's a distributed protocol, basically somebody's gonna come up first or possibly two different devices or five different devices will come up at the same time and see each other's advertisements. We have an election process for which one actually which advertisement wins. And so during that process, uh, the, first, the first guy that comes up in principle is it starts up in sort of the, the um, you know, I'm gonna wait a little while to see other advertisements, but if I don't see any other advertisements, then I'm just gonna start being the SRP server because there's nobody else here. And then other servers that come along after that have to synchronize with the first one before they start doing the same thing. So, uh, the challenge with that is that, it, there, that the way that algorithm works can result in nobody thinking that they're first. <laughs> when that happens, you don't have SRP service. So you gotta be very careful about not like allowing little weird corner cases to result in a stall. And uh, that's not simple. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work on, on finding those corner cases and fixing them. Um, and, you know, so for example, I mean, one of, the, one of the quick solutions to that was just like, if it's been X amount of time and we haven't come up to the normal state, then come up to the normal state. The problem with that is that uh, you can get into places where you might be looping through different guys being primary because of weird timing issues or things like that. So as I said, it's, it's, it's a little challenging. Next slide. So uh, I'll just go over the process of startup a little bit. So the, the way startup works, and this is obviously grossly oversimplified, but we'll assume there's just one peer that shows up first. It advertises via DNS SSD. Uh, next slide. Now a second peer shows up. Uh, it sees the advertisement from the first peer. So it contacts the first peer and begins to synchronize. Next slide. All right, now a third peer comes up. The second peer is already finished synchronizing. The third one starts to synchronize with the primary. Uh, primary, by the way, is chosen by election, which everyone has the lowest number. I think that's already specified, but I'm not sure. Next slide. Um, okay, and then another guy comes along. The, the third guy is still synchronizing because it hasn't actually synchronized with the second guy. Now, the reason that we have to do that is because of what I said before, which is that the, uh, the SRP update is authoritative. So when, when a particular server gets an update, it replicates it to all the other servers that it knows um, that is currently in communication with. Uh, so server two came online after server one. So it might have something. And so, so server three started synchronizing with server two. Um, it's not, it, if server, sorry, server three started synchronizing with server one, Suppose server two gets an SRP update. That update is not gonna be replicated to server three by server two because it happened after, the, uh, after server three started synchronizing. So server three still has to synchronize with server two before it, starts, before it goes into the normal state. Uh, next slide. Okay, once we're done, we have connections between all of the servers. Every server has a connection to every other server. Um, that winds up being uh, n times n minus one over two. So if you have five servers, that, that amounts to 10 connections. Um, next slide. And uh, so that's because of the authority strategy. 
Um, next slide. Um, and then, you know, I explained a little bit about this, but basically, uh, let's say the upper right server is server three. So server three gets an SRP update. It is going to send that to all of the other servers. The other servers don't send anything to each other. So there's no like cascading replication. It's just bam, we get an update, we update all of our peers, we're done. Um, so that, what that means is that the, the, any given SRP update is not going to produce a lot of traffic, um, which is great. Next slide. Okay, so uh, you saw that diagram. Um, like I said, updates only happen when an SRP update happens. So, you know, when you add a server, that means you're going to send the SRP update to yet another server. So that does add some cost, but it scales linearly. Um, the problem is we also need to notice if a server goes down, um, and uh, that doesn't scale linearly because every server has a connection to every other server. So that, scares, that scales by n times n minus one over two. Um, and uh, so that means that if you've got 20 servers, you have 100 connections, you're doing a keep alive more often than once a second, which is not a ton of traffic. It's all unicast traffic over TCP. It's not that bad, but it's kind of a lot for a network that's not doing any work at all. <laughs> So, and this hap that's like continuous. It's going to be happening all day and all night. So, um, so we probably don't want that. Um, and so uh, we actually, um, you know, thread limits SRP servers to five, mostly to conserve space in the thread network data, but that turns out to be probably reasonable. In fact, five might be too many because um, with five, we still have seven keep, keep alives a minute. That's a lot. It's, I mean, I don't know. I think it's a lot. <laughs> um, but that's, that's what's required in order to notice that a server has gone down within 90 seconds. Um, so that's not even like, you know, the RRP kind of a lot. That's just, you know, what we're doing. Anyway, uh, next slide. So currently the SRP spec does not have a limit on the number of connections, which means that if you have 10 SRP servers, you each, they're all talking to each other. Um, so uh, the Apple implementation currently limits active peers to five um, and we have our, our implementation is not doing what I think it should at this point, but we had to do something. And so what we did is we uh, basically have every peer connect to the peers that are advertising, and uh, but only five will ever advertise at a time. So, uh, so the other peers are just kind of standby. Um, and with the standby peers, we scale the traffic to ensure that we notice that one of them has gone away within if, if any one of them has gone away, um, uh, that's kind of okay, but we want to we we know that one of them is alive every 90 seconds, basically, so that if we need a backup server, we have one. Um, so that's, that's what all of this is about. But the only trouble, trouble with that is that right now, the, the uh, standby peers are the ones that are responsible for deciding to connect. So if uh, the way that they're going to notice that an active peer went down is that their connection to it will go down. And when they notice, they're going to connect. Um, the good news is that uh, because we're only one of them is going to, is going to query every 90 seconds, it should, we've got 90 seconds to, to get that one server back up and advertising before the next one will happen. But if, if the next one connects, then we wind up with, basically we don't want to have a thundering herd. We don't want to have like, 50 servers suddenly connect because one went down. So that's where we are with that now. Next slide. So um, I, I've been thinking about this problem and Apton and I have discussed this problem uh, a bit as well. Um, and that happened uh, in a, you know, when we were just chatting in a, you know, peer to peer, so to speak. Um, which is why I, I, the reason I want to I'm talking about having having uh, uh, interim meetings is because I'd really like us to talk about this stuff in the working group and not just like you know Epton and I are sitting around talking and come up with this, but we talked about it a bit and I've actually thought about it some more since the last time we talked. So guess what? <laughs> Everything we talked about is slightly out the window, but uh, but it's all basically based on the same thinking, which is um, so. First of all, um, what I think we should do is uh, first of all as is currently the case, active peers publish an MPNS. The numerically lowest partner ID is considered primary. Um, 
if a peer comes up and it sees an MDNS advertisement, then it's going to register its service that it's capable of doing. It's not doing it yet, but it's capable of doing uh, via SRP using DNS over TLS to the primary, whichever, whichever SRP server that's currently active appears to be primary. And it's gonna send a, a replication session DSO message to start replication. At that point, um, if there are fewer than five peers or whatever the limit we decide on, and I'm not even convinced five is the right limit, but if there are fewer than five or fewer than that limit, um, then uh, when this registration happens, the primary is gonna know that there are fewer than five and it's gonna say, okay, here's your session response, let's go. And we just start synchronizing. On the other hand, if not, then it just sends a retry delay message. And that says disconnect and don't connect for a while. Um, and at that point, if nothing changes, that guy's just gonna sit there idle. It's not gonna do anything um, because we don't need it to. We've already got enough servers. So now we don't have a TCP connection with that server. Nobody's talking to that server. It's just sitting there. But we all, the, 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 the SRP replication because SRP replication is replicating its SRP update, all of the active servers know about it. And so now if, if one of the active servers goes down, whatever primary is there after that can then connect to, to the um, one of the servers, whichever one seems most appropriate and start doing SRP with it. And so essentially now the primary is a little bit in charge of who gets added to the network, which is a change from what we're doing now. Um, but that allows for there to be sort of somebody who's in control. It allows for a way to hand off control to the next person if whoever's in control goes down. Um, and we only ever keep five or however, ever, however many sessions up. We don't keep, we don't have to have a million TCP connections. This TC, the number of TCP connections does not grow with the number of available servers. So that's, uh, that's what I, have come to as, as possibly the right way to approach this problem based on experience thus far. Does anybody have any thoughts on this? <laughs> so uh, opt in here. So yeah, uh, thanks. So one thing. I, Abt I think Abt right can you point. tilt the microphone down a little? Oh, Thank you. Better? Uh, so yeah, I, yeah, I agree. In general sense that like yes i think we, we see the same problem that you raised that like there are yeah it scales up quickly you have too many connections between all and, and like n square basically going up i think you raised another key point which is on the advertising proxy side we now expect basically all the partners or the peers are also on their sense doing the advertising proxy on the infrastructure network which as you said raises all those uh, other conflicts um i like the idea of primary like the, the notion of this like we have one primary uh, one idea is that going, going even further and saying the primary is the guy, uh, is basically practically the only guy who's doing advertising proxy, the only authoritative SRP server. <laughs> the other guys can act as the devices that can receive SRP updates from other devices. They need to send it to the primary to do the advertising proxy side and get the response that is there a name conflict or not, and send the response back to the original receiver to send to the client or directly send to the client, whichever makes sense and practically make it like, like the other guys are not really uh, active. Like the primary is the active one. And once it goes down, another guy gives, basically all the other guys have the same set of data mm -hmm. so that we know everybody has the same set of data. Everybody is ready to become primary if the primary goes down basically. Yep. But they don't need to really act as a full SRP server in the sense of like, hey, I receive an update, I need to parse it, I need to make sure everything is okay, I need to advertise it for you. No. I delegate that also to my primary. I send it to my, I anyways have to send the SRP update message fully encoded, fully basically encrypted as I receive from the client to the uh, other partner for it to be, to be able to replicate. We can have the primary do everything and prepare the response that needs to be sent to the client. And everybody else is also ready. If the uh, primary goes down, they, they can basically become elected as the new primary and they have all the data. Uh, and sort of let, let me go back, like the idea like that came to, uh, the, the background of for this was sort of like the way, like in thread, we have this notion of a leader in the thread network. 
which really is the why that's doing the coordination. It's not really not, not doing any decision making per se. And every router has the same information as the leader. And when the leader goes on, the other guys come, another guy can come be elected. So I was thinking the same model might make sense here that like we have the primary, if it goes down, another guy can become primary and we can have preference that like, hey, you are a better, more reliable device. You have a battery backup or you are a more, uh, yeah, you, are, you have a priority of how, who should be the next leader or the next uh, primary partner. But basically it's getting to say one guy as the main guy and the primary is the main device that does everything. So um, I'm not convinced that that's the wrong solution, but I also, that also occurred to me, of course, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and the reason why I thought maybe that wasn't the right solution is because that then means that there's no load sharing. Um, and if the number of MDNS queries or the number of MDNS uh, services being advertised is small, that's not really a problem, right? But as the number grows, being able to load balance seems like it's a nice thing. Um, and it turns out that I don't think load balancing is all that hard, particularly if we do some of the changes that I'm proposing in the TSR document. Um, the way load balancing would work is basically um, everybody uh, looks at uh, the, so the messages are signed, right? So when a message is signed, uh, so we take the message signature, we do a hash on that. Um, and uh, we hash that with the partner ID of, with our partner ID and with all the other partner IDs. And if ours is lowest, then we're primary. And if ours is not lowest, then whichever one is lowest is primary. Um, and what I think that would do is somewhat even, of course it's, it's random, right? But, but it would somewhat evenly distribute the load so that now we have um, you know, each of the SRP replication peers replicating, let's say you've got five of them. Well, now five, now each one of them is replicating one fifth, roughly one fifth of the data. Um, and as the size of the data gets bigger, that starts to become useful. Obviously when it's the size of the data is three, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, um, I'm not wedded to that. I, there's, there's a lot to be said for simplicity. Um, but, uh, it certainly, what I've seen in our implementation is that it would improve performance. Um, we wind up scanning that list. The, the algorithm for scanning the auth records list is an order of n squared algorithm, which you know, arguably we should fix, but right now that's what it is. I don't know what, that, what the case is in Avahi. It may be using a hash table, in which case it wouldn't have the same issue. But, uh, but so for us right now, uh, increasing the number of auth records dramatically actually really does slow things down uh, measurably. Um, and so, um, and also like we want, forgetting for a moment about speed, um, and actually it's really not a speed issue because the, the elapsed time isn't large, but the elapsed CPU time is larger than it needs to be, I think. So, so if we can spread it out, I think that reduces the CPU time and, and there's some benefit in that. But, and also it, it, it uh, it means that if uh, some part of the network is partitioned with respect to multicast, then we don't lose everything. We just lose that part. In some ways, maybe it would be better to lose everything because that's a clearer indication to the user that something's broken. But um, we can also start looking at strategies to, uh, like, you know, for example, uh, with the, the late response thing that I talk about later, um, strategies for having the backups also answer if the primary doesn't answer, right? So, um, so I think there's some benefit to, to, to spreading the load, but you know, we can talk about that. Um, so let's see, next slide. Got one minute left. Okay. Uh-oh. Um, so yeah. yeah. So let's see. Oh yeah, um, one of the issues is that we have lots of different devices that can all act as thread border routers in the thread case, but just more generally uh, in the case of stub routers or whatever. Um, some devices are like obviously the right device to have as the server. Like if you have a customer edge router that supports SRP updates, that should probably be your server because it can do all of this stuff over DNS. It doesn't have to do MDNS to, to do DNSSD. So, uh, so that should win. On the other hand, if you don't have one of those, and at this point, zero people have one of those, um, then you have options like an Apple TV, which has ethernet, um, you know, 
there, there are uh, like Eero has uh, routers, and I think Google has routers. I don't actually know the products, their products that well, but but basically that have the same functionality. And those would make sense as like, you know, these are really good devices to use for for acting as an SRP server. And then you've got other devices like you know speakers, like a HomePod Mini. You know, it's fine to use that as a as a stub router if you don't have an option, but you'd be better off using an Apple TV. It's got an ethernet, which you might be using. Um, I think the radio in it is slightly better performing. Um, and then there's devices like, um, I think Nanoleaf makes a light bulb that's a border router <laughs> and has Wi-Fi and it has thread in it. And, you know, they did that because they're trying to sell product and uh, they might be selling into a home that doesn't have something else that could act as a border router. But really, if there is anything else that could act as a border router, and I say border router here because border routers are all doing SRP and SRP replication. So, so that light bulb is probably not the right thing to be your SRP server if you have a customer edge router that can be your SRP server, simply put. Um, so uh, being able to have the ability to do prioritization in the SRP protocol uh, seems like it would be a win. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so we're, I guess, at our time limit. So I guess we could continue this after the break. Yep. If there's more, I don't know how many slides are left. Uh, uh, okay. But I still think, I think uh, some folks have s s meetings during the break. So how about we take a 30 minute break, get some cookies, which are absolutely delicious this year. There are no snacks, so don't get any cookies. I apologize for the false hope. Uh, uh, and of course the ADs tell us the harsh truths. Um, see you all in half an hour and we'll be back for more DNSSD. Ah uh, yes, and for for the remote folks, I think the uh, the room will be closed, which will kick all of you out of the room. Make sure you click the agenda item for our next session when you join back, because it'll be a different link. Oh, I need to go run an errand. I'll be back in a half hour. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This one's the first.